Okay, I'm gonna spend 25, 30 minutes talking about the transformer architecture. Uh, this is the machine learning architecture that underlies a lot of these recent advancements in large language models. Um, so I'm gonna be talking 30 minutes or so about the technical details of that architecture. Um, then I will spend five, 10 minutes talking about a project that I'm working on with Saloni, who is in the room, a wonderful, really great high school intern working on fine tuning some of these language models um, for an academic purpose. And then I'll spend the remainder of the talk and questions talking about some tools that I have liked using um, as a practitioner of commercial large language models. So I will get going there. Um, I'll motivate this just by saying there is a type of problem that has existed in machine learning for a while that has been hard to solve by traditional means. And this is anywhere where I have a sequence input and a sequence output. And the crucial thing about sequence to sequence learning is always that I'm not sure how long the sequence is going to be. Um, it could be two words, it could be 50 words, um, it could be time uh, based or, or something similar. So DNA is one of those, amino acids is one of those. Um, and these two problems in language have been greatly transformed by the transformer architecture. Um, so, and, and that's because a lot of these sequence to sequence tasks have issues in things like long-term dependencies, uh, where usually when you have something like a Markov model, I have a state and I have my next state, and the only information I have is from my state one previous. But a lot of the time, especially in language, words that are 10 words away can be directly modifying each other and our brains know it, but it was hard to encode in computer algorithms. Um, another part of it is that recurrent neural networks, which was the previous um, state of the art, I suppose, where you have one state that continues feeding forward and forward and forward through time, which then you train by unrolling it, like it shows on the right, is that this could be hard to train in parallel because every state depends on the previous state. So there's no way to train each of these in parallel because, well, I don't know what the output of my final state will be unless I know what my second to last output will be all the way back to the beginning. So this has to be trained in series, which can be quite slow. So there are, there's kind of a bias because you're seeing what did work. And before this came out, it wasn't obvious that self-attention would be the solution to a lot of the um, field's woes. Um, but the way it works is deceivingly simple, um, but works surprisingly well. And this idea of self-attention is that I have an input here. And let's imagine I have this input X, which is a number of tokens, which you can imagine here just to be words. And um, the other dimension is what we call embedding size, uh, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But I just want you to grant me for this introductory segment that I can take a word and I can make a vector out of every word. And every column in that vector, you can roughly think about as another dimension of its semantic meaning. Um, so for a word like queen, you might have a column that encodes for gender or royalty. Of course, the machine learning would never be quite so clear, but that's kind of how you can think about it. Um, so you take each of these vector representations of every word. And the first thing you do is you separate it out into queries and keys. And then we have a third one called values that I'll talk about in a second. And you can think for now that this is the exact same thing. The key is just some forward projection of X and the queries are also some forward projection of X, the same N and imagine for now the same D on the other dimension. And what we do is we just take a pairwise dot product of these two matrices with each other. So for every word, I'm taking the dot product of that word's feature vector with every feature vector, uh, with every other feature vector that is also in my input. And the output of that is what we call the attention matrix, which is an N by N matrix. Again, where N is my number of words. So this N by N matrix gives me number of words by number of words matrix, where the idea is that every entry in this N by N matrix is kind of a pairwise similarity between the semantic meaning of two different words. So if something is very high in this um, attention matrix, it means that those words are related in some way and they should modify each other more directly. Um, we also take a soft max here. This is just normalization that makes every row equal to one, which helps for computational stability and things like that. Um, and after we have this comparison of how closely every word modifies each other, we do another matrix multiplication, again, with this forward projection of the input. So we multiply the values by this N by N matrix to get this output matrix Z. 
The output matrix Z is again, taking my uh, feature vectors, multiplying it through by the n by n matrix weights, how much every word modifies each other. And it creates the Z matrix, which is n by again, just imagine this top one is the same D, which is like a contextualized re-representation of, of the feature space. So here, every word is kind of embedded in context of the entire English language. But on the bottom right here, you can imagine each word is now reinterpreted or recontextualized in the specific context of this sentence. So maybe an illustrative example would be to think of a homophone, which can be the same word with two different meanings. And here, these features need to encode for all of the different meanings because every uh, vector here is just a sequence of letters. A word is just a sequence of letters here. It doesn't know which interpretation or which context to take each word. So here on the bottom, hopefully it's contextualized within the bounds of the sentence I'm looking at. Now, this is just a feed forward operation. There's no training that goes on here. So then the question is, how do we train it? Well, the easy thing to do is just to throw a weight matrix that's trainable in front of each of these three forward representations. So I train three different matrices. I have WQ, WK, and WV. So this is a queries weight matrix, a keys weight matrix, and a values weight matrix. So each of these, it's a little bit harder to get to like a, I don't know, like a, a nice distillation of what these actually mean in human terms, but with an intuition for how these queries and keys are this kind of pairwise comparison, some people would say it's kind of like a database where I take each word and then I say, okay, how is this word related to every other word in my sentence? Um, and these queries and these keys uh, kind of pull out different adjacencies between different words that you train over time as you train on long sequences of words, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, then we also train this WV to maybe get a little bit more targeted about, okay, now the words need to be changed a little bit. These feature vectors need to change a little bit in terms of how I'm going to weight them after I have this N by N matrix. Uh, so you can see what this process looks like on the bottom left. Here, I take every key and I take every value. I just do a dot product. So that's a one um, number for each comparison. Um, and then I multiply it through again by my values to get some feature output. Okay, I will stop there at the basics of the self-attention block for any questions. All right, if not, I will keep going. So here I wanna motivate exactly what these word embeddings look like a little bit more. Uh, so I mentioned this before, where you can think about each column as having some sort of semantic meaning, um, though in the real model, these semantic meanings are going to be a little bit more abstract. But the idea is that the dot product of words that are similar is going to be um, uh, higher than the dot products of words that are far away. So in the feature space, if these words are related, they should be closer in the embedding space. So here, cat and kitten are closer in this 2D projection of this uh, dimension space than dog and houses. But one thing that you have to think of when you are trying to interpret and conceptualize these models is that even though dog and house are very far apart, they're actually pretty similar on a few different axes. They're both nouns. Uh, they're both things that you would see in your day-to-day -day life. Where if I took the word dog and the word um, conjecture, maybe those words are quite different. Um, but still, maybe they might be similar on different axes. Um, and then there's also this idea that if I have two pairs of words, that are different along the same axis, that difference uh, magnitude and the direction of that distance should be pretty similar. So here, man and woman are supposedly only different by the gender of those two words. So they are different in this feature space in the same way that king and queen are different. Now, of course, these models are pulling apart every little bit of context. Um, so these differences will probably be less simple and they are shown here, but that's the general idea. Okay. Now, one other thing that is not implemented in self-attention as written here is any degree of positional um, relevance between two different words. So if two words are close or two words are far in self-attention, I'm going to weight them exactly the same because all I care about is the similarity or difference in semantic meaning. So there's a little bit of extra juice that we put on top, which is a positional encoding. Now, this is really conceptual and it's a little bit hard to understand. You could definitely spend a couple hours learning about why positional encoding works. But the idea is I want to take um, a vector that is the same length, depth here, the same dimension D as my word embedding. 
and I'm going to add it to every word that I'm putting in. So depending on the word's position in a sentence, I will add a different vector to it that will augment the word embedding in such a way that I'm now encoding the position of that word in the sentence. Um, and the exact choice of positional encoding is a little bit fiddly because at first you might be tempted to do something like what you do in a coordinate convolution in convolutional neural networks. Or maybe you just add another feature on top that is from zero to one and you have some linear spacing, which is the number of words you have. But that has a little bit of an issue where it destroys this dot product similarity that I had earlier, because if I have one that's being added to a word versus 0.2, uh, the difference in magnitude between those two numbers is going to cause my pairwise comparisons to suffer a little bit. So the people who came up with this decided our positional encoding should be a one by D vector for every word where the dot product of two positional vectors that are close to each other is higher than the dot product of words that are farther away. So the general idea is that words that are closer inform each other more than words that are farther away. But if you look at the magnitude on this plot here, it doesn't drop off to zero because I still want to allow for words that are far apart to inform each other. Now the exact structure of these vectors that have this property is a little bit more complicated and has to do with a little bit of Fourier analysis where I'm going to represent each position as a sum of sines and cosines. And uh, if you're interested, you can go later into exactly how they did it. But the general idea is that the frequency of these sines and cosines that I'm adding together uh, increases as I move down in position so that I know as I'm increasing in position, I'm never going to repeat the same sequence of sines and cosines again. Um, so you can see what the, um, positional encoding to look like as I descend through position here. Um, but again, the only thing that really matters is that two words that are close together are going to be weighted more than two words that are farther apart. Okay, so now we have the pieces and now we just kind of have to throw them all together. So what you will hear when people talk about transformer architectures as we put them together in what is called intention head, um, the attention head is just kind of the concatenation of the things that we've talked about so far. So I would take here on the left, my words as input. So here they're talking about the GPT-3 architecture, which has a context length, that's the number of words I'm looking at at a time, of 2048. And that D is 12288. So this is a really rich, high dimensionality representation of every word, right? 12,288 numbers per English word. And they, it's not quite per English word, they break it down a little bit more, but that's how you should think about it. We multiply through by WQ, WK, WV, um, and then we get our query key and value uh, matrices here. Multiply through here, this is self-attention, softmax times our values to get the output. Then what you do is you do this number of heads times. So here, this one set of self-attention we'll probably pull out some semantic similarities or differences between words along some axis. So this might be like really understanding one homophone or something, but we want to understand a whole bunch of different similarities between words or between um, different phrases. Um, of course, the machine learning gets broken out really abstractly, but we wanna learn a whole bunch of these weight matrices. So we stack the self-attention head number of heads times. GPT-3 does it 96 times. And you can start to see very quickly how the memory usage of transformers can explode very, very quickly. Um, where if each of these matrices here is 2048 by 128, and we have uh, 96 heads times three, that can end up being a lot of weights. Another thing I should mention um, that I kind of skipped over before on the word embeddings is how we get those word embeddings. Um, so the way that this works is we have our words in English, and basically we create a huge lookup table that we train. So the word cat will maybe be associated with the number 128, and that number is always going to be associated with cat. That number is now an index to what is called the word embedding table. So that will be a uh, size vocabulary size, so that is size of my words in English by D. And the, uh, fe the feature representation of every word will be trained alongside everything else. So that is also a huge matrix that needs to be trained. After we do all of our heads in parallel, 
um, we can now concatenate the outputs. So we take each of our uh, outputs of our attention matrix times our V, and we just stack them all right on top of each other. We do a last linear feed forward layer, and we get some output. Then after this, we can feed forward to whatever we want to train for our task. Okay, so putting everything together, uh, this is the uh, figure that you will see a lot if you look at transformer architectures. This is from the pretty famous paper, it's called Attention is All You Need. And what they were focusing on was a problem of translation. Uh, they were looking at English to French as an example. Um, if we track this through time, we have our inputs. So we have our words here. The first thing we do is we tokenize them, like I was just saying. We take every word or every subword unit and we create indices into a big table. Then we index that table with our words to get our input embeddings. So this is now our n by d matrix. That was the input to the self attention. Then we add the positional encoding. So this is just a straight addition. Another thing, the positional encoding is not trainable. It is that same sequence of signs and cosines for everybody. Then after we do the positional encoding, we feed forward to our attention. This multi-head attention is just the idea that I'm having all of these parallel self-attention things in, um, in parallel. Uh, then we get a little bit weirder and a little bit different than what I was saying. Um, and this is where it comes down to the difference between the engineering and the theory of the thing. So there's the issue in recurrent neural networks that this is trying to solve. And this issue is still here, which is the issue of vanishing gradients, where if I have some output all the way at the end of my network, and I'm trying to determine how does my each weight matrix and my attention contribute to that output, it can be hard sometimes to see how much is a little change in one of these weights way at the beginning of my network actually changing my output. So these layers right here, you can see that this skips. I take my input plus, plus my positional encoding, and I just skip right over all the hard work I did in the multi-head attention I did. And I add and I normalize that to the output of my multi-head attention. The idea there is the skip connection decreases the distance from my output to my input embeddings that I'm also training and makes it a little bit more targeted. Um, we do this again. They decided that another feed forward layer helps them out. Um, and that is, um, this guy over here, the concatenation of all the multi-heads. And we do the same thing. We have the skip layer, add and normalize. Okay, the last vocabulary word here is cross-attention. Cross-attention is when I take the queries and the keys from one set of words, and I take the values from somewhere else. And the reason for this is specific to their translation issue, and anything else that can be modeled in a similar way. Uh, their input here is actually two at the same time. On the left here, my input would be my English sentence. And on the right here, my input would be my French sentence. And the output is also what I'm trying to train against because I want my English translation to go to what I expect the translation to be. But if I'm trying to pull out the different commonalities and adjacencies in the language, I need to do that both for English and French and to see how does every word inform each other? How does the context change? for both English and French at the same time. So um, that's what we do. We do this attention here. We do this masked multi-attention over here. The only thing this mask does is it doesn't let me look ahead. Um, so I can't look at words that I don't know. And I'll explain that on the next slide. Um, and then what I do is I take my queries, my keys from this distillation, this learned representation of my um, English sentence and take the values from here. So the idea here is that I use my distillation here to form that n by n attention matrix. Now, how every, uh, every word in my English sentence informs every other word in my English sentence, but the semantic meaning I actually want for my output comes from French. So I'm going to take the values that I'm learning from my French sentence and multiply it through by attention matrix I'm getting from English. Same thing, add a normalize, feed forward, add a normalize, linear output, and then we get some output probabilities. Okay. So now that we have the structure of the architecture, we can now talk about what training regimes actually work for people. And what is 95% of the training of these models is what they will call um, uh, unsupervised pre-training. Though I think it's a little misleading to call it that because we do have very clear labels. Um, what we do is we take a sentence so far, we take it one word at a time. And what we try to do is just guess the next word. So here it'll say not all heroes wear, and then it will get passed through this um, entire architecture right here. And then the output probabilities here 
is just a vector that is one by vocabulary size. And what I'm getting there is just what is the probability that any word in English could be the next word? Um, so here, it will find that there's some probabilistic representation here, where after I look through a whole bunch of data, you know, it's not always clear what the next word will be, because in English, it's not deterministic that I write one word and the rest is just determined. Um, so depending on the implementation, I can either always take the most likely next word, or I can do what I think most people do nowadays, which is they take this as a probability distribution, and they just sample from this probability distribution to figure out my next word. So I just do that over and over and over again. I see my next word, I see my estimate, I see what the truth is, and I do backprop over and over and over again for every word, every sentence. So you can also get an impression for how long the training is, because every example pretty much is every word in my input. Um, another thing is that this input sequence is short at the beginning. So the common thing that people do is they just pad the end with zeros and they just say, I'm only going to look at what I've seen so far. All right. So this brings us to the actual GPT-3 GPT model architecture, which looks a little bit scarier, but it's pretty much exactly what we just looked at. So this is the input. Um, we, these matrix multiplications are just the same as self-attention as before, but they add a little dropout layer in here. Um, then we do some linear stuff to take each of my heads and concatenate them um, in parallel. Then we do some dropout again, do another normalization, and they found that if they upsampled the linear layer, used a GLU here instead of a ReLU, it worked better. I don't really know the intuition there. And then they collapsed dimensionality back down, did one more thing, a dropout, and then they figured out what their output was. Yeah, could I, could I ask a question here? Oh, what is a dropout layer? Ah, yes. So a dropout layer is one of those things that seems weird, but actually works. Uh, let me pull up a picture because I think a picture explains this very well. One second. Okay. Ah, I need to reshare with my whole screen. One second. Okay, so it kind of looks like this, um, where the idea is if I'm training a neural network, I'm training a whole bunch of different adjacencies, I'm approximating a very complicated function. But when I'm training a neural network, I have both a training set and a testing set. And the training set is just supposed to be some approximation of the world of information I will want to use my neural network for. And a neural network, if given the chance, will just memorize your training data. Um, and that is something not desirable. Well, maybe it could be. Maybe you do just want some mathematical representation of your input data that you can just crunch through. But a lot of the time, I want to train on a subset of all the information that could exist in the world so that it does well in other areas, what we call generalization in machine learning. So here, what dropout is, is it's saying, in order to get a little bit more distilled in what I want to learn, I'm just going to set a whole bunch of the weights to zero, and I'm never going to change them. Um, and this is a little weird. It's like, why would I destroy my neural network in order to learn better? Um, but it's one of those things that kind of just works. Uh, by zeroing out a whole bunch of the weights, you're kind of asking it to solve a harder problem um, and be a little bit more targeted in which features it's actually adding to each other. It can't just use everything to learn everything. It needs to pick and choose what factors actually determine your output. Um, so you can imagine it maybe a little bit of feature selection but a very low cost for the, for the programmer, because I just say, take 25% of the weights and just set them to zero. Um, so you'll see this a lot in, um, in really all machine learning areas, convolutional neural networks, feed forward neural networks, and here it also works in transformers. Does that make sense? A quick question about that, uh, going on the intuition that it's uh, making the learning effective, more effective by making the problem harder. Is there, um, sort of a curriculum approach where you start out uh, with fewer of the weights being set to zero. So it's not so hard at the beginning. And then as learning progresses, you make more of them zero. Yeah, this is kind of where uh, you see machine learning as sometimes more of an art than a science, yeah. where for different problems, I might want to drop out more or less. It's the kind of thing where you kind of build up some intuition over time. It's a function of how hard your training is. The training's going to take a couple of days. 
minutes, it's hard to do a curriculum like that. But if I can train a couple minutes, why not? I'll do drop out from 5% to 60%. And sometimes at 60% of your waist dropped out, you can do pretty well still. Um, it's just a matter of seeing what is my training loss and what is my testing loss. If I'm performing about the same accuracy in train time and test time, then I probably don't need dropout. But if I'm seeing I'm doing a lot better on my training data than my testing data, it implies to you that you're overfitting and you want to probably increase some dropout to see if you do better. Um, this general field of approaches where I have overfitting, and I'm trying to solve that, is called regularization. So dropout is one of those things, but there are also a whole slew of other approaches that people take to try to correct that difference. But dropout's really easy, so people do it. But Justin, the which exact neural units are zero dot changes between like patches or epochs. Right? Exactly. It's not like it's zero dot for the rest of the training. Yeah. So usually I will set dropout to be throughout my entire training, I'm setting these neurons to be zero. Um, but across different initializations, so like say I train, I start my training, for the entirety of that training run, the same weights will be zeroed out. But if I want to use like a different seed or something, because machine learning is so, you know, random and stochastic. On a different initialization, different weights will be chosen to be dropped out. It's literally just a random choice. Okay, see. Okay. Um, yeah, so that, that's kind of it right now um, for the architecture side. I guess I'll talk about the training data. So um, in reality, they don't actually predict words. They predict what they call tokens. So the I think the current approach tokens is that they split words every vowel. And they have some consideration where like double vowels are allowed and, and they probably did some linguistics to figure out what worked best there. Um, but what that does is it limits my vocabulary size because there are tons and tons and tons of words. They found if they split up each word into little tokens um, that it's able to constrain the vocabulary size a lot better. Um, and funnily enough, it will make up words for you if you ask it to. Um, and it kind of gets at the structure of how words are created a little bit better, um, as opposed to just words, where I'm only seeing how words are connected. Now I can kind of see how these chunks are related. Um, 300 billion tokens. So they took a, a really sizable chunk of the internet to train these things on. Um, and so I said, this is called unsupervised pre-training. After this, there's additional other curriculum of training um, to solve some additional problems. So this as it is right now, like if you worked on GPT-3 a couple of years ago, the way that you actually used it is you would try to start a sentence and kind of cut it off halfway. So you would start with something like this, where you might type a robot must, and then the language model would finish everything else. But now if you use ChatGPT, you can ask it questions and it will answer. So there was a fine tuning on GPT-4 for uh, ChatGPT, uh, where they trained it again on question and answer data sets. So they would give it the question, and ask it to make an answer. And they would estimate, um, what is my answer? And then how different am I from a real answer? So what it learned is, what is the structure of an answer that people want? And I think that data set was actually pretty small, like a couple thousand question and answers, which is why you might see that ChatGPT has the same kind of structure and how it answers you a lot of the time. They like that because it makes it more predictable. Another thing that they have done to continue training is doing more of like a reinforcement learning approach to try to get outputs that are more desirable to a general public. So they have paid data labelers and proofreaders to take a whole bunch of different outputs from GPT-3 or GPT-4 and say, which of these are more desirable? Which one of these is more sensitive to certain subpopulations? Which of these is more positive or more negative? Maybe in general, we want to promote more positive answers. And this is where it kind of comes down to like, what do you actually want to do with your model? For a big company like OpenAI, they want to make sure that the outputs are palatable to a general public and that they won't have any controversies or scandals. So that extra step, trying to condition their model after it learns about how language is related to each other, um, helps them. Another thing that I could do is I can try to figure out, once I have these weights, how can I fine tune it for my task? Um, so we will talk about that in just a second with Saloni's work. And um, the general idea here is that these models can be really, really, really big. Like the model weights right now can get up to hundreds of gigabytes for one model. 
which is way more than even the biggest production GPU from NVIDIA can handle. Um, and is way out of most consumers' price range um, and maybe even like technology feasibility range. Like if you were a corporation that wanted to train these, you probably just couldn't because they're so hard to get a hand on hundreds of these GPUs at once. And each one costs like ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000. So we wanna figure out, can we fine tune these without training all of the weights at the same time? So there are a whole bunch of different approaches there. Um, the general idea is you can freeze some weights. So you say, maybe I only wanna train that last feed forward layer um, as one thing. Another thing that you can do is you can take this entire network as your output, and then you can just try to append a few feed forward layers on top and try to train that. That's called a hyper network. The most popular approach right now is called LoRa, which is pretty fiddly and complicated, but the general idea is it tries to come up with some like learned feature representation of the difference between your output, what you're fine tuning it on. Um, but the general idea is that say I have a whole bunch of different models. I have a model that's pre-trained on academics and I have a model that's trained on, um, I don't know, some product data or something. I don't really want to have to download all of those weights at once. Maybe I just want to take the big model, the big GPT-4, and have a little thing that I can add to that to say, what is the difference between what I want to fine tune it on and the big weights? Because I probably don't want to rewrite its understanding of the English language. I just want to give it a little bit of extra context. Um, so I will give it to um, Saloni for now to talk about the project that she's working on with me. Hi. Oh. Can you guys hear her? Uh, Can you no, hear me? We're, we're not. Try again. Um, computer. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, so my project that I'm working on with uh, Justin is it's called Neuro LLM and it's basically trying to determine if we can produce uh, good data to fine tune an LLM with an academic graph. So we created this academic graph by uh, starting with a few authors of interest in a specific field, so neuroscience in our case, and we picked 13 authors to start with. So and we picked, um, we found all of those authors papers. And we took all the papers of all those authors. And then uh, we took all the papers that were cited in those papers and on and on until it built this network of um, papers. And so the original 13 authors have 488 papers. And when you go up one level, so the, all the papers that were cited in those papers, um, that gives you 81, more than 81,000 papers. And two levels out gives you more than 19 million papers. And for a little bit of context, um, only 5 million papers are published every year. So just two levels up from this academic graph gives you so many papers uh, as potential data for uh, fine tuning this LLM. Um, so our LLM that we're gonna uh, we decided to fine tune was Llama because uh, Llama is Llama's weights are open source so we can uh, we can fine tune the weights straight away. A lot of the um, other large language models like for example GPT their weights aren't as accessible to the public. But there's been a lot done already with fine tuning Llama like for example Stanford made Alpaca which is actually kind of just like. Um, GPT with the question and answering. It's a, uh, it's a way to fine tune Llama on instruction following data. And so there's a lot of fine tuning approaches already created. And our basic concept was how can we fine tune Llama without retraining the entire, um, entire language data set because Llama is huge. The biggest one is 65 billion parameters and that's approximately 130 GB of space and so our the one we're using right now is 7 billion to test out with at first because they can get really really big so we'll be using LoRa um, to fine tune and that reduces the number of trainable parameters by a lot and the GPU memory as well compared to um, if you were to fine tune it without LoRa um, and additionally we uh, there's one uh, paper that came out recently 
uh, called PMC Llama. So that was basically fine tuning Llama on about 4.8 million papers from PubMed Central. And so that was trying to create a uh, model that was very good at medical information specifically. So I'm using that as kind of a way to guide my fine tuning approach for um, your LLM. Thank you, Sloni. Um, do you guys have any questions on that? The challenge here is really this step. Um, I don't know if you guys have been following controversies with Twitter and Reddit about them locking down their APIs, um, but really a lot of companies have found out that their data is very valuable to language model trainers. Um, and of course, academic paper uh, servers have also realized that their, their information is very valuable. So getting a license, an academic license to uh, text and data mine these huge um, paper servers is pretty coveted nowadays. You really have to kind of wait in line and do it very nice. Um, I apologize to anybody who was unable to use archive a couple of weeks ago because we actually made a mistake in the API call and they shut down uh, Julia's access to archive for a couple of hours. Um, but you know, if you're not breaking anything, I don't know if you're doing it right. Or that's what I'll that's what I'll say. I wasn't fired. So. Just a, a quick question to make sure I understand the premise here. The the idea by this sort of training is that the network would be able to answer questions more like somebody who is an expert in the content of all those papers? You can almost think of it as trying to make a conversable database of all of the academic information adjacent to you. Like you may have heard about how a lot of these language models hallucinate information. And that's because they just don't have the very technical information at the ready in their weights. Like they might learn how this technical word is related to this technical word. Once it comes to interpretation, it just doesn't have enough information. Now, I'll show in a second some examples. A GPT-4 does a really good job. But if I was just to fine tune it and say, after learning about all of language, read all these papers and learn how these words are related to each other, the hope is that if you train it well enough, I can ask it, like, you know, what is the role of a Kenyan cell in the excitatory inhibition circuit in the mushroom body? And it would say, oh, you know, from this paper, I see this, this, and this. Um, and then it really simplifies a lot of your research because you can just talk to your little partner um, and get a lot of information. I think with this, as with any LLM, it's trust but validate. Um, but, you know, that latency between I have a thought and I want to figure it out is a lot easier than saying, okay, I'm going to go to Google Scholar. What are the keywords I need? Uh, this paper seems all right. I recognize this author, control F, sort through. Um, instead, if your guys read 19 million papers, maybe they can do a lot better. So just so I understand, once you have that graph um, and you've generated this database of 20 million papers, you, you don't need the graph anymore. Right. Once you have all the data, the only thing I'm using the graph for now is I have some idea. I'm not sure if this will work out like I want it to. If a paper is closer to the people I'm interested in, I maybe want to train it more. So the ones at the top, the ones of the authors I like, let's really train those. Let's train these pretty well. But maybe the ones that are pretty far away, I give one or two passes. Um, yeah, the graph is more to create the data set close to me. But once you have it, all you do is turn all the text into tokens. And that's numbers that you shoot into the machine learning algorithm. Our tokenization approach actually is a little different because like we were following what PMC Llama does, which is we tokenize all the papers, but then we uh, pick random subsections of 512 tokens for each paper to go off of there to kind of create a more like, so you're not going only on the first, uh, first 512 or only on the last 512 to kind of get a more um, accurate reading of all the papers as well. Yeah, there's a lot of considerations about like, once you have all this data, if I was to train on every single word, of every single paper, it might take until 10 years from now to finish. So there's a lot of considerations technically too about how do I pull out what the most important information is. But I, I guess what you're trying to do here is you're trying to really specialize it, having had a very complete knowledge of certain fields where there's a lot of overlap between the papers that might be presented. 
And uh, so it could also be done like you're just looking at like maybe all the papers submitted to a particular conference that is focused on a field. And so then it would specialize on that field. Is that the general idea? Yeah, exactly. Like this is a little bit of a selfish project because the 13 authors I picked were associated with my research area. Yeah. So I'm like, I want to make myself my own little superpower for writing papers and making grant ideas and things like that. Um, because all the information that I care about is in this model. But um, if you go to my GitHub repository and you have your authors, you can fill in your 8, 16, however many people you like, and then make your own graph and fine tune it for you. Um, so yeah, the, the idea is having something that is catered to your research interest um, because it's probably infeasible to train it on all academic information. I'm sure the big brains at OpenAI are looking at it and they certainly have done it a lot with GPT-4, um, but with the consumer grade models, um, I think that you wanna bound it to things that you're interested in, um, but maybe use everything that's learned about English language to make it conversant. Like I'm starting from a pretty good baseline that I can talk to, and I'm giving it all the specialized information. There's another technique which confusingly also seems to go by the name fine tuning, which does not actually involve changing the weights. It involves um, taking uh, probably a smaller database of specific knowledge and doing encodings on it and putting it in a vector database, and then uh, doing an encoding of your your uh, query and similarity search and pulling the pieces from your own knowledge that you can that are most relevant and putting them in the the query context, which you then submit to the unmodified neural network. Now that. That seems to be a, a popular approach. There's a lot of discussion about how to do that with Langchain and various things like that. Do you have any intuition of when it makes sense to use that approach versus the approach you're doing here, which involves actually retraining the weights? Totally. So I'll give some examples of using GPT's API to do that in a second. Okay. Um, and I don't know, I kind of don't like how they've muddied the water of what the word training means or fine tuning means. Yeah. Um, Cause you're really conditioning the model with something like Langchain or putting something in context. For me, what I think about is how much data do I want it to learn? If I have like three papers that I want it to read and I want to ask it about those papers, I think that works great. But for distilling a huge amount of information, you need to be a little bit more creative. So you'll see um, how a lot of the plugins to GPT-4 will get really creative about how they use the API of like um, academic search websites to try to find out the vector space and the vector similarity between different papers, try to figure out a paper that you're interested in. But if I wanna get the specific information out of each of those papers, I really don't have enough real estate in my context to meaningfully know all of that. So if I have a whole field that I want to be very conversant with, then I think I need to do real fine tuning, changing some weights in some model. But if I have something that's more bounded, even if I have like a, a GitHub repository and I want to learn about the API, um, the context size in GPT-4 is really, really big. And you could probably fit the entire API of the entire GitHub repository in that context size. But if I wanted to learn how to talk to like a thousand APIs at once, I probably don't have enough space. I think it's really just like a how much data do you want to look at consideration. Um, you'll see the way that they kind of cheat is like if you try to go over the context size, the model will talk to itself and it'll say, okay, here's my first thousand tokens. Summarize those tokens, take the summary and make that the input to the model, which is, it's a cool approach, but of course it's going to be lossy and you're going to lose something in the act of summarization. Um, yeah, so if, if you need the fine details, it won't work for you as well. All right, I will continue on to how I use some um, commercial tools, and I've broken it down into four areas here. I separated into research, development, ideation, and communication. And I'll talk about a few examples of each of these. And I'm going to go down the scary rabbit hole of pulling on in my internet browser on a recorded meeting. Okay, uh, the first one I wanted to show here was that one that um, I was showing for the graph visualization. 
this wasn't isn't strictly an LLM tool, um, but it does some cool LLM-y things in the background. Or I can start over here. I can plug in my Zotero, um, which is what I use to catalog all the literature that I read. And it will make an adjacency uh, graph between the citations of all those papers to each other. So before, uh, how I made my data is my graph edges were do two authors co-author with each other? And then what are all of those authors' papers? Here, the graph is by uh, citations. So I can take a paper and then it uses their backend LLM to try to say, okay, let's read all these abstracts and then let's go to our vectorized database of papers and let's try to come up with the most similar papers and let's make a graph the citations of those. So I think this is kind of neat because you can kind of see which work is citing each other. Um, you can find, try to find the little islands in uh, the academia. So this is what I wanted to show at the beginning, just based on the work that Saloni was doing. If you like this paper here was really relevant to these guys, then this guy over here is almost like a complete graph where everybody's citing each other. Okay, um, the next spot I wanted to go to was just using um, GPT. So I have a few examples here. Um, so here is just GPT-4, no fine tuning, no plugins or anything, just looking at the output. Because I think some people who haven't paid for it don't know the step from GPT-3 to GPT-4, and it's pretty large. Here I'm asking it, can you explain to me the computational structure of the Drosophila ring attractor, including the origins of angular velocity input and landmark input, now the compass neurons project later parts of the brain. So if you don't know what the ring attractor is in Drosophila, it's a really complicated part of the central brain of Drosophila, the fruit fly that figures out where it is in space. In the grand scheme of human knowledge, it's very niche, um, but very relevant to people in this building. Um, and for my knowledge, there might be people on this call who know it a lot better. This is pretty good explanation. You know, it tells me what it is. It tells me why it's relevant in a computational sense. It tells me where the angular velocity comes from when it breaks it down. Um, it tells me where the landmarks come from, which is how the fly remembers objects in its environment to know where it is in space. It tells me how it tracks that location. And it tells me how that information is projected later in the brain. And this told me a piece of information which I didn't know, that it projects to the lateral accessory lobe, which I thought, oh, cool. This is now a source for me to go into Google Scholar and get more things to search on. Then I can interrogate it further. And now what the model is doing is saying, okay, what is the user's question? And what is all the other previous information that I've answered? And it uses all of that text to condition its next answer. Um, here, it tells me, okay, I'm not completely sure. Um, and it is pretty good at knowing when it is sure or not. And um, it tells me more very specific information, sensitive to the fly's turning speed. Um, it interacts with these particular neurons. It has this anatomical structure. And for my knowledge, again, most of this information is right. Um, I ask it again, what is the specific information? And this is also correct. And this is a model that also knows about how to write Edgar Allan Poe and also knows the lyrics to hundreds of songs. Um, and it also knows this information about the fruit fly brain, hey, which is kind of nuts. If you go back a, a little bit when it was talking about the limits of its own knowledge, like you were, you were saying, it was that yeah, here. I, I, how did it get that is, you know, to neurons in Drosophila is not fully elucidated as of my last update. Is, is it pretty much just knowing that other authors have said it hasn't been fully elucidated inside the introductory remarks of papers? So it's a great question. And a lot of these things about how does it know information X, Y, or Z are actually active research areas because it seems to a human observer that there is some emergent structure here in the machine learning algorithm, that predicting the next word alone seems like too primitive for the depth of information that it's telling you. Now, I think most really deep machine learning people will tell you it's mostly an illusion that if you have a model that is hundreds of gigabytes in size, it can have these really complicated things memorized. Um, but again, the adjacencies is learning between knowledge are sufficiently complicated that it probably has some feature that is tracking, is this very well studied? Is this not very well studied? Um, and if it sees along that really complicated feature representation that is not very well studied, it knows that the thing it needs to say is somehow in that context. 
Um, I think the first instinct is always to say that it must be memorized. There must be some paper that said that in 2021, um, it wasn't fully understood. And maybe that's true. But I think that I see enough of these occurrences and other people are talking in a similar way that it really does learn these really complicated things about information and about language. Uh, Justin? Yeah. Uh, how well does it recommend uh, specific papers? So terribly. It is really, really bad at giving you papers. Okay. And if you say, can you give me citations for each of these? Yeah, that's what I was Yeah, let, let's do it. I have to get something else here. Three, I, I think, gave me links that were non-existent. Right. It will say a paper, and I'll be like, oh, that looks like an author list. That looks like a paper. That looks like a journal. And it's completely fabricated. Um, because that, that it probably only saw that citation one or two times. So it learned what citations look like, then remember what each citation looks like. Mm -hmm. That's a great segue to my next one. Um, I'll skip this one. This is another one which is like, oh, can you give me a history of preprint servers like Archive? And it breaks it down into a numbered list. Um, and this information, I, as I looked it up, all of this was accurate. Um, this guy started Archive here and then started splintering. Um, really cool stuff. Um, so the next thing is how do we give it a little bit of extra information to answer Zena's question? Like, how, what if we want citations? What if we want it to be engaging with real information and marry that with what it's learned about both the English language and really complicated basic information or even pretty complicated information about particular topics. So here's where um, OpenAI will say plugins come in within GPT-4. So a plugin is just really an API call. It's really an API call with some wrapper. Um, I see in the uh, chat, ah, I will pull those up too. Thank you, Phil. Um, so here I'm using one that is a PDF reader. So here I gave it a paper. So here I gave it the Laura paper um, and I asked it, like, can you give me an overview of the algorithm? And it's pretty good. Um, it does a pretty good job. Here it says, okay, I read the first five pages. Do you want to keep going? Um, and it does a pretty good job. Uh, cruising along on some examples, I wanted to talk about their code interpreter because this is really nuts. Here I just said, do something basic. I said, just take sine waves as input and random integers as labels and make a two-layer neural network. And this is really cool. It says, here's what I'm going to do. And then it says, here are some questions I have for you. It says, how many sine waves do you want? How many points do you want each sine wave to have? What are the dimensions of the neural network? And what I can do is I can say, okay, let's give it this many sine waves, let's give it this many points. And then I can say, okay, how are the dimensions of the neural network are up to you? They should be small to be trainable because it will actually run this code. And here, it created this code and then it executed it. And you can see the standard error, the standard out here, and then it plotted it for me in Matplotlib. That's sick, that is crazy. Um, like this code ran and it showed me the output. And it also said, oh, my first one crashed. And then it figured out why it crashed, corrected the code and did it. Um, here is my input data. Here it created the neural network. Um, this seems like a reasonable size for what I asked it to do. And then it ran this neural network and it produced output. Here it said, okay, here's my network structure. Here's my forward pass. And then it trained. It trained for two epics like I told it to. And it got lost. Um, that's crazy. Like this, this is crazy. Um, and I, you know, there's a bound to the kinds of problems it can solve. But this was a real problem that I can see myself asking. Like if I, I use PyTorch for neural networks and I haven't used TensorFlow as much. So if I ask it, can you give me an example code to do this in TensorFlow? Well, I don't need to sort through 10 stock exchange articles that are not quite what I want. Um, and it, it can just do it for me. Uh, Did you say that this is a plugin? Yeah, so this is one of the ones that they actually have. So the plugins here, they're all third party. So there are like, like this one, some random research group made this PDF reader. Um, the code interpreter is inbuilt. Okay. Another one that they have inbuilt is uh, internet browser. So you can ask it to search with Bing. Um, but that one's shut down right now because they found that it got a, people are using it to get around paywalls because OpenAI was paying for like Wall Street Journal subscription. People were just asking ChatGPT to summarize Wall Street Journal articles. And Wall Street Journal was like, no, don't do that. We want people to pay for our service. Um, so they're trying to figure that out right now. Um, okay. Now I wanna talk about some other ones that use ChatGPT as a backend, um, but have a little bit of extra juice. So here's one called find, P-H-I-N-D. 
And here I'm asking to do something pretty fiddly scientifically. I'm asking it to register two point clouds using this specific registration algorithm, which probably has a few articles online, but it's really mostly in academic papers. I wanted to use um, this Python um, package. And that package almost certainly is not overrepresented in GPT. So what it does, um, you can see it will search and then it will read the API for this package and it will know, okay, here I'm going to import it. Here you can run it if you want. Um, then it's going to define it using that API and maybe some Stack Exchange answers it found. And then it will actually cite what it used. Um, so here you can see here are all of the sources that it read in 15 seconds to give me the answer that I needed. Um, and again, you will find if you use this, it works for some domains and doesn't work for others. But for something where it's like, this API kind of sucks, it's not very well documented, I found that those are really good areas where it can give me something to start on, even if it doesn't just work right out. But sometimes it does. Um, I want to give another example of how this can be interoperable with other um, software. So I use a software called Obsidian for dealing with my notes. So you can see I have all my notes over here and then it creates kind of a graph database. So it's a kind of a wiki, so I can click, okay, I wanna click on this. I have over this project, blah, blah, blah. Um, and it creates a graph of all of the notes that I've taken. So here's like my, some of my knowledge in a graph and somebody wrote a plugin that said, okay, I will take your graph here and I will, um, you can talk with it. And you can make new notes and do stuff like that. Uh, and so many of these projects are popping up. Another one that I have for research here is called Elicit. So this is one that is kind of like billing itself as a Google Scholar replacement. Um, so here I asked it, Drosophila, what is known about which types of neurons are spiking and which are graded. And what it will do is it will kind of extract, here are papers that I think are close. And then it will use the language model to summarize the abstract for you and give you an idea of what the paper is about. It also will tell you on the left here uh, what it thinks the consensus is. So here it says, here's what I got from this paper, citation. Here's what I got from this paper, citation. I think that when I look at things that are things I know very well, um, it sometimes doesn't get the citations I would think are the most important, but it's pretty good. Here, uh, this one is from X Janelian, Gwyneth Card. Um, and these are all like, you know, people that are very well esteemed in the field. So it does a decent job of pulling it all out. Um, and then what I can do, so I can click on it and it will give me more information. So it will use its language model and it has some pre-built questions that it's asking of the paper, saying here's the abstract summary. Here it's saying, what is the style of the paper? Here are the outcomes. This is probably based more for medical things. And then it will also search through papers that cite this paper to try to see if any of those papers critique this paper. So you know whether or not other people had an issue with it. And then it will give you a little snippet of all the other people who have cited it, which I think is really cool. And is really, this part in particular, the other citations has really helped me with um, finding out if a paper is salient to my research or not. Um, another one for medical stuff is this one, Consensus. This one does something similar. You ask it a question and it will say, here are papers that I have seen recently and it will do a semantic, or sorry, a, um, oh man, I can't remember the word I'm looking for. It will say, is it yes, no, maybe, on is it good or not? Is it accurate? Um, and it is pretty good. Okay. I have jetted through a bunch here. Um, I have another example of the code. Okay, these ones are good for ideation. The last one I have is communication. So I have been using um, language model tools to help me create skeletons of presentations. So here I'm asking it, here's a paper that just came out, really big connectomics paper that my lab leader, Srini, asked me to do a, a journal club on. And I read it, I annotated it, and I was like, okay, what would you think is a good structure? And here it's like, oh, here's your slide one. And this is information that's pulling straight from the text. This is the exact quote, pretty much. Um, and these questions that it said, it came up with itself, which it is saying are the key questions that this paper is asking, which I think was really neat. I just, I copy and pasted this. This was really good. Um, but it will just give you junk. Um, so everything that I put down, this is really good for reducing the friction, for like starting something. 
but I would never just like copy and paste this onto PowerPoint. Um, this is a really good place to start. And then it, it almost tells you like, even if it's bad, it's like, oh, now I have to engage with the material and like determine for myself that this is bad and figure out the way I need to change it to make it good, uh, which is better than saying, staring at a blank screen, in my opinion. Um, yeah, and it does good stuff and I can ask it more specific questions. Um, but here it does a pretty bad job. Here I'm like, okay, can you give me information about the first figure? And it's like, I can't find figure one. But of course, there's a giant picture with readable text that says figure one. So then I said, okay, can you print me the paragraph that starts with this? Just so I can see what it's actually reading. And it gives me like the next paragraph, which I don't really know why. But then if I say, okay, figure one starts with this. And then the results section that describes that figure starts with this. Can you give me some content? And then it does a pretty good job. And it gives me three slides about what I wanted to do. Um, then I can say, these bullets are a little bit too wordy. Like I don't just want to read my slides. So can you condense them? And it's like, sure, here you go. Um, and maybe this is a little too concise, but you know, I can change it up to be what I want. Um, and I just do the same thing. And you know, maybe the sum of the amount of time I had to work with the language model is more or equal to what I would have been doing otherwise, but I think it's a, it's a nice workflow. Okay, so I just kind of blitzed through a whole bunch of applications. I will stop there for now. Um, and I'll ask anybody if they have any questions. I'll leave it at this figure. Okay, yeah, what are you saying? Um, I, I just had a nice presentation and uh, I was, I was, so it seemed like the, the, the first part you were talking about fine tuning um, the, the, the LAMA model, right, which is uh, one way. And then for all these tools, they, they look like they're taking the, uh, a different approach where it's sort of um, uh, relying on tools and, and looking things up, right, uh, so it doesn't hallucinate as much. Right. So this is what Philip was saying before is like what they will call fine tuning is not what machine learning people would call fine tuning. What they're doing, really every single GPT plugin is just being really creative with API usage. Um, so what you will see in the back end of something like, um, I don't have one pulled up right now, they have like an academic search API. All that they really do is a kind of two parts. One of them is you ask it a question and it will determine like, what is a, um, it's kind of like prompt engineering. Like they will have, here's a good prompt to do what the user probably wants to do. And then they will format your question in that prompt. And then they will call their API and get the information from that API. But the information it gets needs to be pretty small because it needs to fit in the context size of GPT. However, the context size right now for GPT, I think is 2048 tokens, which is like a thousand words more or less, which that, that's like, you know, that's almost a paper right there. Um, so I would, yeah, it's not fine tuning, but it's being really creative about how I can take information from some data source that I have and add it to the context of the model. And all of that information will then like prepend your prompt. So under the hood, it, the model is getting, here's all this junk about what the user is asking. And then here's what they're asking about it. Use your model and the junk up top and give them an output. Yeah, and, and um, so I, I guess the question is like, which are these complementary somehow or is one better than the other? Like, do you see fine tuning being useful if you can just, if, if the AI can just look up all these papers on its own and, and pull directly from the papers? When it needs to? I think that they're large and complementary. Um, they, they solve kind of different problems. Like here, I can ask it about this paper, and maybe it could store one or two more papers in its context. Beyond that, it will have to ask itself to summarize these papers beforehand. Or if I'm somebody like Elicit, I need to do a whole bunch of work ahead of time to try to like turn each paper into a vector, and then their server will like take your prompt convert that prompt into some vector and try to figure out what you want. But what it doesn't have is it hasn't fine tuned the language model on all of these abstracts, for example. So every time I query the model, um, it needs to ping its own server and then reduce all the abstracts down every single time. But if you fine tune the model in a machine learning way where you're changing the weights in some meaningful way, 
Um, all I need to do is just query the language model and all that information is at hand. Um, so if I need to find information about a thousand papers at once or a whole journal's worth of papers, um, fine tuning in a machine learning way will get you closer to what you want than here. Here I would need to be like, here's a paper I want to talk to. And um, then I will throw that out and I'm gonna take another paper and I'm gonna talk to that. Yeah, that makes sense. The the right the, the scale of what you're you're looking at, right? The is it, is it everything, or do you just want to concentrate on one item? Right, uh, right. So my workflow here, for example, is I will use the literature search tools to figure out papers I like. And then I will take the papers I like, and then I will pull them into the into the chat or something like that. Mm -hmm. So Justin, and, you had mentioned before Bing when it was able to reach out to the web and insert the um, you know the web links. Mm -hmm. Was it doing something a, a, akin to like if you asked it a general question, uh, it would gather up summaries that would fit within its context, or is it doing something different? Um, so my understanding is that it will take your prompt, and then it has another prompt engineered a little bit of text under the hood that takes this prompt and tries to figure out of what is the appropriate search. So it will search using its own proprietary database and it will somehow, you know, the same way that Google does, rank those links. Then it will pull each of those links into its own context and then produce an output. So all this is doing is trying, like the, the entire website of find.com is trying to figure out how do I make a prompt for GPT to figure out the information? And the idea is that if I put technical information in the prompt, then GPT will have that information right at hand, ready to use. Hmm. So it sounds like some of the uh, downstream sources of this information could be pretty useful in a proprietary way to companies. So like if Microsoft owns GitHub, they've got right. like <laughs> Yeah, totally. Um, so they will not ever show you exactly what their prompt is to determine this. Because really, they're just using GPT the same as you. And the extra sauce that they're doing is just figuring out how to figure out how to use your prompt and their database to make you a better prompt. Great. That's, any other questions? I know we're uh, a bit over time here, but everything will be recorded so people can go back. And I think we'll definitely have to, um, if you can, we'll we'll post the slides uh, up to the Slack channel and also maybe some of these links because they look pretty interesting, all of these tools that you were mentioning. Yeah, I'd be happy to. A lot of the links are, um, the ones that will be conserved are in here. Are in the so screen. GPT or OpenAI lets you um, create shareable links so anybody can use them. Um, and then I have, links just to the website for the ones that don't have shareable links like that. Right. All right. Uh, cool. Yeah, yeah. There's a few more minutes. Um, just uh, about, uh, you mentioned hallucination, right? That, that when you train that, uh, fine tune that LoRa, oh, that uh, Lama model with LoRa, it hallucinates certain things. I was wondering if, um, there's, I know with open AI, there's like this temperature parameter that you can set. And like I played around with it in the, in the open AI play box, uh, playground or whatever they call it. And uh, if you set it very low, it's supposed to hallucinate less. And maybe if you set it high, it just makes the words up even. Um, I mean, but do you, do you have any sense of how that works or how that relates to the, yeah, the stuff? I don't know if the top of my head but my intuition is it would be a meter on this probability distribution. So maybe if the temperature is low, it will only pick a word if the top probability is very confident or something like that. Um, I'm not totally sure exactly what the temperature is modifying under the hood, but that would be my best guess. I think you're right. When I was researching this last year, that's what it said. It, it goes on the probability. And then if the temperature is like very high, then it picks like the second most or the third most. Um, likely instead of the first most. Gotcha. Uh, okay. Okay. Makes sense. And it, do you know if there's something similar for Llama or? Yeah, I mean Llama and GPT are essentially the same architecture. Um, okay. A lot of GPT's extra sauce 
is in how do they train it after the unsupervised pre-training, which is the, what is the next word task. Um, and a lot of that is what OpenAI is keeping secret more or less because it's their special sauce. Um, another kind of editorial comment I'll make is I would almost think of OpenAI in the same way as Amazon. Like Amazon is not great for making like the best shopping website ever. They're more great for making this huge logistics approach where, you know, they made two day shipping work and all of this, you know, a lot of people will say that Amazon's more of a logistics company than a tech company. And OpenAI is kind of the same way where yes, they have really gifted, brilliant machine learning engineers, but the really, really, really hard part of what they did was trying to figure out how to string together thousands of these, you know, 20 grand graphics cards together or to train a gigantic model. Um, for comparison, the biggest consumer grade model is 65 billion parameters and GPT-4 has 1 trillion parameters. So that would be 128 gigabytes times 20 is 20,000 something gigabytes model size. That's huge. Um, and how they are running inference on that in a couple of seconds when I give it a query is really crazy. Um, yeah. Well, cool. thank you. Any other questions? Okay, well, thanks you thanks so much, Justin. This is uh, really informative and I think a great uh, bootstrapping effort for hopefully some of our future LM focused uh, talks.